Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and then finally Mike Collins, plus their suit technicians, now boarding the transfer van for the trip to the launch pad. When you watch the 2019 documentary film Apollo 11, you see a lot of shots we've all seen before, but different. The footage looks so crisp, vibrant, and distinct. But why? How did this happen? And why did it take us 50 years to get this footage and be able to enjoy it in this quality? And this episode is sponsored by me, I need more dot space slash shop. If you want to help support me doing more of this type of storytelling, just pick up a shirt. It would really mean a lot. And I do try really hard to make shirt designs that I think people would like to wear around. So if you want to support more episodes like this, please consider buying a shirt from I need more dot space slash shop. Back to the episode. The 1960s was a transformative era for visual media, primarily due to the fact that color televisions were becoming a standard in home living rooms. For 10 to 20 years leading up to this point, filmmakers were doing their best to make their films look visually distinct from the 4x3 television picture. So they would film on wider aspect ratios that could best be experienced in theaters, thus encouraging patrons to pay their $1.42 to see the movie in all its glory before its sides are chopped off for television broadcast. Now, I say all of this for a reason because this scenario affected how filmmakers captured the launch of Apollo 11. A year and a half before Apollo 11's launch, NASA reached out to famous documentary filmmaker Francis Thompson and offered him access to the Apollo 11 launch in order to make a film about it. Thompson signed on to the project and partnered with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or better known as MGM, to fund the project and handle distribution of the final film, which would include recreations of the landing and moonwalk. Sadly, in 1969, MGM went under reorganization and decided not to back the film anymore. Six weeks before the launch of Apollo 11, NASA called Thompson again and said that although the big budget film was obviously dead, they did not want this event to slip through their fingers. Nor did they want to make the kind of industrial film which was pr usually produced after each NASA mission. NASA said they could scrape up together about $350,000 and wanted to know if Thompson could do anything with that. Already involved with another project, Thompson asked his editor, Theo Kameki, if he had interest, and Kameki jumped on it. Kameki quickly got on a plane in Washington, D.C. to meet with NASA to discuss what they were looking for in this project. Also warning them that there was only a few weeks into the launch and little time to prepare. The NASA public relations rep said, look, I know there's not going to be any interest in this film after it's finished. People are going to be pretty well stuffed with space programs, so let's just have this be a time capsule. And NASA never interfered with anything they wanted to do. They gave him complete access to anything he asked for. Now, remember that film versus TV thing I talked about earlier? Theo wanted to capture this moment in a unique way that no one else would do, with rare 65mm super widescreen film stock that would look amazing in theaters. The film would also be captured as a 65mm negative and transferred to a 70mm positive film stock, which was known as the Todd AO process or format. Now, there are a few logistical hurdles to consider when shooting with large format films. The film is physically bigger, which means the canisters and cameras are bigger. You cannot just simply put the camera on your shoulder and start filming. Think of it like a modern day IMAX 70mm camera. So when you watch back the Apollo 11 documentary, the easiest way you can tell when you're looking at the 65 millimeter film is it's likely filmed on a tripod, framed beautifully by the way. Since these cameras were huge, Kameki turned to camera operator Urs Furr, whose name means bear, because he was one of the few camera operators in the world who could shoulder mount the camera when needed. Fur would be stationed outside of the launch, while Kameki was inside the firing room with the likes of Werner Von Braun. Kameki was allowed inside with his camera, film, and tripod, but nothing else. He was given a NASA camera operator to help him film the launch from inside. Some of the most impressive shots in the Apollo 11 documentary look like they were filmed using a dolly. But in reality, Kameki had his NASA camera operator find a wheelchair and push them around so Kameki could nail these shots. I love it. Anyways, Kameki filmed the mission from the ground in Florida, Houston, and on board the USS Hornet over the next nine days with his small crew and pieced together the film Moonwalk One that was released a year later in 1970, which over time developed a cult following. 
If you'd like to watch it, you can click the card above. Now here's where even more technical hurdles come in. NASA could not use any of the 70 millimeter film for their public affairs purposes. They just simply didn't have the cameras or projectors to utilize it. So they had it transferred to 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter film stocks, chopping off the sides and degrading the quality so that the rest of the world could use the footage. You were feasibly cutting the resolution in half or into a quarter of what it originally was. Now this makes sense from a logistics standpoint and Kameki opted to finish Moonwalk 1 using the standard 35mm film stock, half the size of his 65mm film from the launch, likely due to post-production costs and having other camera angles that were originally filmed in 35mm by NASA camera operators. Since NASA didn't even have a Tadayo projector to play the 65mm film negatives back with, it was just put into an archive and they let the public use the 35 and 16 millimeter film transfers for almost 50 years. Fast forward 47 years and film archivist Dan Rudy and his team at the National Archives and Record Administration came across these huge film canisters, 62 of them having labels related to Apollo 11. They take out the film and realize that it's a very strange film stock, but it was in incredible condition. He reached out to experienced large format filmmaker Todd Douglas Miller to help figure out what was exactly on the footage. Well, it turned out to be a gold mine. Miller quickly began working with the post-production house Final Frame in New York City to develop a film scanner that can take in this rare 65mm film. Along with the 70mm engineering film also used that was the total opposite in terms of dimensions. It was taller than it was wider they were able to build a scanner that could take film as small as 8mm up to 70mm with the ability to scan up to 16K resolution. Now yes, there is no TV on the market today that can play back 16K resolution, but in the film and TV business, we like to scan our film in a higher resolution. That way they get the best color, sharpness, and ability to stabilize or reframe the footage. To give you an idea of how different the footage came out to be, here are some examples. Here, we're first looking at a shot of the crawler going down the crawler way from the film Moonwalk 1. Remember, this is the 35mm scan of the 65mm Todd AO, cropped on either side. Now here is the exact same shot, but from the 65mm Todd AO. Holy cow, there is no doubt that this shot makes a way bigger impact with the wider aspect ratio. The framing feels less cramped, because that is what the camera operator was seeing through his viewfinder. Here are a few more examples for us to compare. I think we can all agree how much more superior the 65mm Todd AO film is in comparison to the 35mm film we have been fed for the last 50 years. I am incredibly thankful to the filmmakers of Apollo 11 for not only the brilliant story they told in their film, but also the painstaking steps they took to scan this historic film stock properly for us all to enjoy in the future. I hope you learned something new today about the Apollo 11 film. There's just so many great behind the scenes stories in these documentaries that I just eat up and can't stop learning about. Anyways, I hope you learned something. I hope this video earns your subscription and uh, thanks for watching. Give it a like and let me know in the comments what you think. All right. Have a great one, guys. See you later. Bye.